Hello everyone, so I'm Pericles, I'm, the, I'm an intercalating medical student at Queen Mary University of London um, and I'm very very honoured to be here today to tell you a bit about my career story so far and about the university application. I really enjoyed honestly Dr Russell your last words about medicine and how it really is more than just a career, more than just like a degree, something more li lifelong. Um, uh, so um, so a bit about me. So I'm I'm not from the United Kingdom. My name may, may make it <laughs> may make it clear. Plus my accent as well. I'm not from here. <laughs> I'm from Athens. I, I went there. I studied there. Um, spent ninety nine percent of my life over there. So I did the IB because that, that that's what what was available at my school. Um, and I did biology, chemistry, and mathematics in English B, which are the equivalents of four A levels, and then two extra A, three or four extra AS subjects, something along those lines. It doesn't matter so much about the grades and stuff. So what I've done so far, I've completed three years of medical school, so two years of preclinical medicine and one year of clinical medicine, and this year I'm doing an intercalated bachelor degree in biomedical engineering and clinical materials at uh, Queen Mary's. Um, so far, I have received two scholarships, one research one to do summer cancer research and one leaders one, which is the one that I'm doing at the moment. Um, I also hope, uh, because I love research and I do believe that through research, we can advance uh, uh, our field and improve the care we deliver to patients. I'm involved with research, research at King's College London and more fields. Uh, and yeah, I envision myself not so much as an academic in the future, but more of an ophthalmologist who will combine clinical medicine and entrepreneurship. Um, so that's all about me. Um, um, so, um, just want to clarify, um, I don't have any financial disclosures to declare, and I, and my everything that I'm going to say today obviously come, is my personal opinion and doesn't represent the opinion of my medical school um, and all other affiliations that I have. Uh, so it's purely my opinion. <laughs> and today's talk, what I'm going to talk about, um, is about the university application. Do bear in mind that it has changed a lot since I uh, went, went into, got into medical school in 2019. Um, plus, it, it is getting, it is changing as uh, time goes by, uh, which changes that I don't, I'm not aware of either. Um, so uh, just keep up to date with the most, the stuff that they have that each medical school has on their website. Um, so in terms of the application, so the UK's deadline for medical school is the 15th of uh, October, much earlier than uh, for any other in, uh, for any other application, which is the, I think, the 15th or 3rd, first of January, I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> so <laughs> what you have to do, what you have to submit to be there is your personal statement, um, your GCC uh, grades, A-level predicted grade, AS grades, I guess, as well, reference letters, um, in the UK CAT. So the BMA, I checked it as well a few minutes ago, is no longer needed and will no longer be required in the in in for UK medical school admission. So medical schools like UCL, Imperial, Oxbridge and, and the others have uh, will be using, I guess, the UK CAT or creating new a new test. I don't know, they don't know either. So <laughs> they won't be using the UK cap for those um that um had a fear about the they they, 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 they they're gonna use something different. Um so and you get four medical medical schools you can um so you can choose up to four and you can also choose one non-medical school. Um so maybe um what I did and what most people do as well is they apply for four medical schools and then they apply for one medical science or a course, for example, at another course, again, like a biomed pre-med course that will allow you after the four years uh, to apply as a graduate for medical school or to, in some medical schools, I think like Exeter, they allow, uh, if you're amazing in your first year of biomedical med 
play medicine, whatever it is, biomedical, medical sciences for you to go into first year of medical school. But that again is very, very the, the examples of that happening are very, very slim. Um, but it can happen. Um, so what then happens after you submit your application, you wait for an interview in July between November and February. Um, some universities let know, uh, will send you emails earlier, some others won't, some will uh, leave for the last minute, that's how it is. <laughs> and then what you have to do is you have to attend the interview from around December to April. Um, so just for me to explain and touch upon and maybe bit repeat on what Dr. Russell said as well. So the way it works, is the, at least in my mind, that's Pericles. Um, they want to see over here, in terms of your grades, that you have the academic aptitude. You understand, for example, the science, because medicine, although it's a lot of practical stuff, clinical stuff, blah, 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 it's very, very science as well, it has a lot of science. So you have to understand stuff. You're not, we're not, a, a, how to say, like a sponge, absorbing information. You have to understand information to be able to apply it. Uh, so it's very, very important for you to have amazing grades especially on your CCCs and predicted grades. And that's the bare minimum. So if you don't have that, you won't progress to anything else. So how, how it works, is they start with your grades, they, they look at the grades, they're like, okay, you meet the minimum requirements. You can progress then to the next stage of our assessment, which will be UK CAT and I don't know what will be for Imperial and the other BMAT uh, schools. But then they, they will use that one and they will, they will, and they will look at probably the whole cohort that has applied, that has passed through the minimum requirements of A-levels and CCSEs, and they'll be like, okay, so we cannot invite 5,000 people for an interview, we're going to invite 1,000. So or a thousand. So the way that we're going to do it is we're going to sit, we're going to get everyone above 30%, uh, top 30% of UK CAT scores or the equivalent that the BMAT schools are, are going to use. And that's how it's done. So the better the UK CAT score you have, the higher likelihood you're gonna get an interview. That doesn't mean, for example, that if you don't have a good UK CAT score, you may not get an interview. That's why you have to be very, very strategic with your application. It may well be the case, you may apply, for example, to bars. They love UK CAT. So if you have an ama amazing grade in UK CAT, you will get an interview. More more, more like, you're more likely to get an interview. Well, if you apply, for example, to Kiel, if you have amazing work experience, it counts more than your academics. So it's very, very important to understand how which medical school works and to use your advantages um, and match them with what they're asking. Everyone may want to go to Oxford, but not everyone has a grade and not everyone has their stuff, let's say, go to Oxford and Cambridge. So very, very important to um, work with your uh, strengths. So once, for example, they've looked at the BIMA, they're like, okay, we're so now that you have the aptitude and we want to meet you. So they also may or may not use a personal statement. The personal statement, as I call it, is like the passport, your CV, uh, which tells the story about a, a bit more about your motivations of wanting to pursue medicine. Um, it may and may not be used uh, pre-interview. It will definitely be used, at least to an extent, on the interview. Once you've reached the interview, they want to see you. They want to see who you are, how you behave, and how you can react. Very, very important because you are not uh, in medicine. You're not working alone. You're not a stock trader <laughs> that works on the back of <laughs> uh, uh, the basement. No, it doesn't work this way. You work in a team. So they want to see you, how you interact with others with the interviewers and how you can think on the spot, which is very, very important. Um, and then once those requirements have been, once they've, how to say, they're happy with you, they will give you an offer for you to meet. If you don't meet the offer, obviously, then you fail. You have to redo, reapply, so on and so forth. And yeah, that's how it works, I guess. Um, uh, bum, bum, bum. Then... So a bit about, more about the entry requirements. So you have to have at least three A's. I recommend you go even more than three A's because um, 
today, nowadays, it's, medicine is so competitive and only going to get more competitive. So the higher grades you have, the more likely you're going to get a position. That being said, if you meet the minimum requirements, you're fine. <laughs> but the minimum requirements are quite high. Um, and yeah, then the personal statement and the work experience. So Dr. Lasso did talk about a bit, of, a lot actually about the work experience. I don't have that much of information to tell you. But what I'm going to say in terms of the work experience um, is that it is not only for them to see that you had the motivation or you were committed and all of this stuff. No. I see the work experience, and I obviously didn't see that if, see this in this way when I uh, was applying. Um, work experience is like for you to see what it is before you take the plunge. It's very, very important <laughs> because I see people in my cohort that have dropped out from medical school or uh, all the years because they didn't know what me uh, medicine is for. Um, so work experience is for you to understand if it is... <laughs> Quite honestly, if it is worth your time <laughs> to pursue all of this stuff. So don't see it as a, as a tick box exercise that you have to have on your CV to satisfy the interview, to satisfy medical school. See it for yourself, use it for yourself also to determine if you actually like this profession. And yeah, then, then the interview that I talked about. Uh, but, but, um... So in terms of the some advice for, for the UK cat, you cat, however you want to call it, same thing, <laughs> a different name. So um, there are many, 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 many resources uh, out there. Um, and the the problem with so many resources, it's hard to choose which are the ones that are the best one uh, that that you um that you should use. So I highly recommend the UK CAD websites, free of charge, and they do explain honestly how to all the question types that can come up, or most of them, um, with word solutions to understand honestly the philosophy of the UK CAD examiners. Very, very good, amazing resource, which is there for free. You can honestly get, um, they have amazing uh, abstract reasoning question banks, go through all of them at least once or twice if you have the time. Medify is another amazing question bank that you can go for. It does have a cost a bit of money, I'm not hundred percent sort of the pro the current price. Um, then another book, I don't know if it's <laughs> amazing book actually that I used back in my day. Um, it was getting into the get into medical school, the uh, thousand two hundred and fifty questions UK cat book. Quite harder than the others, but I think worth if you have the time. Um, if you don't have the time um, to prepare, I will focus on only one and two. Then some other resource, if you want to spice it up a bit <laughs> and you're very, very dedicated, you can do the medic pool to question bank. I don't know if it's free. I think it's free. Um, then there are Kaplan books, Kaplan question banks. You have to pay for them. And the uni admissions, they have a question bank, I think, and some books. There are many more resources, honestly, many more. These are the ones that I've tried, so that's why I recommend I've put them over here. But there are many more, especially because the UK CAD is used for Medical, admission, medical school admissions in Australia and New Zealand, hence the change in the name instead of UK CAT to UCAT. So there are many more uh, resources that are coming out as time, uh, time goes by. Um, but these are the ones that I use and I can recommend. Uh, so tips. So in terms of the, uh, for the UK CAT, please guys, please, Sit the exam before you start year 13. It's very, very hard to find time to advise for, for this exam if you have to go to school. So it's very, very important to sit a few, sit it a few weeks before in September, for example, so you have a lot of time uh, to sit a few weeks before you start uh, or, the, or a week before you start or even a few days. If the more, um, my recommendation to everyone is the more time you spend on this exam, the better you're gonna do. Uh, because it's not about aptitude so much. It's not about whether you have an IQ. Doesn't matter. You may have the highest IQ, but you may not be the best one on this exam. <laughs> so the more you practice, the better. And practice, practice, practice is very, very important. And timings are important as well and should be a focus because my understanding at least of the exam is if you were given the exam on time, you should be able to get 100%. Not on everything, but actually, how does it? The general consensus. 
that being said, so you have to make sure that you can do, you can get a good grade, an amazing grade on the, the allotted time. And you have to know the sections well beforehand. You cannot go on the exam and, I don't know, <laughs> make a quiz. <laughs> And the exam is going to be, it's not going to be. <laughs> so be prepared and be pre prepared early. Um, and a very, very good skill that you can do every single day, even before you formally start preparing for this exam, um, is you can download on your phone or your tablet or whatever device you have, the BBC app, and you can read the health articles, which are quite nice, quite informative, will help you as well for your interviews. <laughs> Uh, but you can practice speed reading. Um, so, yeah. Uh, the B1, I'm going to skip them because it's not like relevant for you guys. Um, in general, tips in general for any type of exam, especially for these ones, you have to do track your progress. And how do you do that thing? You obviously, there are different scores you get and everything, but you should do self assessments, mock tests for you to actually. Simulate the procedure and see your, how you perform under timed, under test conditions. Um, and you should start early to uh, very, very early. So if you can, for example, and if you're set that you want to do medicine and, th and you want to do well, I would even start from year 12, going through it every week, a few hours, if you have the time um, to familiarize yourself. Um, it's very, very important. Um, don't get if you what when I did the UK CAT, um, I did a few courses and not that I recommend them, um, but they said, for example, you should do a, a, a mock test before you start so you can see which sections, for example, you have a problem and you should start with them first, um, so you can maximize your score better. As I said, you should read articles from the BBC. And you should practice practice. Um, that being said, guys, I'm, I just want to clarify this. And I should have put my score at the beginning. I'm not. I didn't get a good score. I got an average score, and I'm still in medical school. I got into um, a good medical school, I guess, um, in my first attempt. So don't be disheartened so much if you don't get the highest score. I did not get the highest score, and I'm still in medical school. <laughs> doesn't determine whether you're going to be a good medical student or a bad one. Doesn't, it's, a, it's a ticking box exercise for the medical school to see if you have um, committed enough to actually practice, because most of the skills you won't be good at. Uh, so work experience, Dr. Asso covered it very, very well. Um, I'm only, I added, I think in, there are different online work experiences as well that you can do just to add up on your CV for you to listen to different things, different opinions. Um, but I highly recommend honestly to get hospital work experience. That's the more, in my opinion, that's the most useful thing to do because you're gonna see how it's, how you will be practicing it, how you will be, will be for you in a few years time if you, again, you decide to take the plans. Uh, so, um, for you to get a hostile work experience, however, it's very, very hard. Different trusts have different policies. They may ask you to, to, to do a criminal check, uh, like the DDS checks and everything. It may be a very, very big procedure, but I think it's worth doing that procedure, because it's worth going down that route because it will really help you gain exposure. Um, um, so for the personal statement, so because I love mentoring, I've seen many, 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 many personal statements from different people that from my different mentees. There are you on your personal statement. Obviously, you have to describe yourself and your motivation. Do not start about the dying relative. Every this is very very clear. Honestly. Everyone has a, no offense, everyone has someone that died. <laughs> Maybe that motivated, but it shouldn't be the only thing that motivated you to pursue medicine. So it's very, very important um, that you don't necessarily talk about, uh, at least on the book, it's not about the dying relative. You talk about, in general, other stuff, uh, like the sciences, or if you um, wanted to become a doctor from early on, talk about that and how you enriched your interest um, along the way. 
and do not write stuff for example oh i did that course oh i did um i'm amazing at that explain why are you putting it inside why does it matter for example if you write for example that you've done this work experience what did it teach you you reflect upon this experience on your personal statement and you should have already done so um after that work experience or after that experience but regardless you should reflect and it should be a reflection a reflective representation of yourself the personal statement that's how it should be you should all also not be uh, very passive not be a don't be a narcissist or anything but you have to obviously show that you have what it takes you have the motivations and you have done stuff along the way to prepare you for a career in medicine and you also need to show that you're a well-rounded person not just a, a med nerd and i do mean that thing it's very very important that you can so and uh, maybe from some experience that you have how you um have shown, for example, communication skills or teamwork skills. Um, very, very important stuff. Um, so life as a medical student, so I'm, because I've done both, I've, I've been the lucky and lucky medical student because I started medical school at the cusp, after, uh, at the cusp of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I started as a normal medical student, just like everyone else before me, but then the COVID-19 pandemic broke out, um, no medical school, no exams, which, <laughs> so um, in general, at least for preclinical year, in preclinical years, you have lectures every single day uh, from nine to five, other than Wednesdays. So I guess it's common for everyone in, the, in every UK medical school uh, that you have lectures only in the morning and the afternoons. So you can go for the sport, do anything other than medicine. Um, so um, you have anatomy classes, physiology classes, you have many, many lots of stuff to make you a good doctor. Different medical schools have different styles. May, some, some medical schools have like mine, for example, you may have to go to the GP every once a week or once a month or something along those lines to do work experience, which is amazing because you can, you, are early, you get early clinical experience. Some medical schools don't have that. You have to wait three years to be, um, or two years to be a clinical student to do those stuff. But anyways, the stacks of virus across medical school. But the main is you have lectures. At least for two years, you have loads of lectures <laughs> and a lot of practicals. And then after two years or after three years, depending on where you go, um, you become a clinical student. And what that means, your learning is done in terms of your scientific learning. You obviously do learn, a lot, but your learning is more geared towards patient care. You don't learn so much about the science, you revise the sciences along the way. Um, but you go in most of the time, at least in my medical school, most of the time, and I guess it's everywhere. Um, we have like one, one or two weeks of lectures, and then we have 10 weeks of hospital placement where you are an integral part, or you should be an integral part of the medical team working with different um, doctors, junior doctors, all and other allied health professionals. So it's much more stimulating and people prefer, and I prefer as well clinical medicine um, than preclinical medicine. And yeah, that's how, uh, that's how it is uh, as a medical student. And yeah, that's everything. Thank you guys. <laughs> <laughs>